the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. In the 60s, young people came to California wanting to find a better life. To join this cult meant eternal salvation. Tony and Susie were our gods. Him that believeth not shall be damned. He was business. She was gospel. They produced a television show. Amen, Susie. Our God is real. We started working, and all the paychecks went to Tony and Sue. You got two, three hundred people doing that, signing over paychecks. You get rich pretty damn quick. The labor department sued because they weren't paying the employees. The move from California to Arkansas was like the great exodus. Susan Alamo wanted to get away where maybe things weren't quite so regulated. They told us when we would be rewarded. They told us when we were going to be punished. Beat your child with a rod to save them from hell. My mother started this mess. This was horrible, harmful. I wanted to make damn sure that they never ended up with my kids. I said, I need to leave. And she said, I'll kill you before I let you do that. The people in Arkansas, I think that they realized very quickly that we were a commune or a cult. Um, certainly, everybody thought we were really weird. The Foundation headquarters lies on a hilltop near the town of Dyer. Visitors are not welcome. But from the air, one can see the Alamos' home and the huge dormitories nearby, where untold numbers of Foundation members live. The local people started rumors. You know, they were afraid. And Dyer, Arkansas is a little town. So we wanted to show that we were good neighbors. So they took pictures of the kids swinging and playing in the pool and swimming, showing that we're normal, everyday people. And it was all staged. I was born into the Alama Foundation. I remember when the Foundation book came out. Nicer furniture was brought in, new bedding. I mean, there's a picture of me and my sister in there. Just We just looked as happy as can be. And we probably were in the happiness we knew that existed. And they showed a uh, pig farm. Well, yeah, we had a pig farm. And if you got in trouble, you got sent to the pig farm. Like, reproach to work at the pig farm. How did two people get all these people to buy into them? They were good manipulators. And when it came to the media, they knew what to say and they knew what to do. I worked here in Arkansas as editor of the newspaper for 26 years. The Alamos were fairly well accepted. They opened a grocery store, service station, a restaurant. They were always extremely well-dressed. They rode around in Cadillacs, and uh, Susan was very quick to tell you that she was one of God's children, and God wants his kids to go first class. It was supposed to be the Cadillac ministry. We're going to all work hard together, and all of us are going to have mansions and Cadillacs, and you're going to raise your children without fear of you know, being raped or murdered or you know, whatever horrible things existed in the world. It was part of the theater to keep the faithful in line. They looked at Tony Alamo and Susan Alamo, and Tony and Susan have a Cadillac. Tony and Susan are on television. It was a celebrity lifestyle. Tony and Susan were very proud of the really known stars that they could get to sing at their restaurant in Arkansas. They started bringing in country and western singers. When I had Dolly Parton there at the uh, restaurant, we took in $100,000 every two days. Bill and Hillary Clinton came to the restaurant, and even he said Tony Alamo was like Roy Orbison on speed. Tony and Sue wanted to be famous, and I think this was a, a middle road for both of them. They got to be in the spotlight, and they also got to keep the money. 
where else can you get thousands of followers and millions of dollars and not have to pay taxes on? Mama could do anything. Mama could lie. Mama could cheat. Mama could steal. It was okay if Mama did it because the Lord sanctioned it. Our children are our major concern at the foundation. They have beautiful places to live. They have big playgrounds and swimming pools. And we sacrifice so that the children can have the very, very best of everything. When I was four, my family went on the show. And I remember getting dressed for it and my parents threatening, you know, if you're bad, Grandma Susie's going to be there. Rebecca, are you happy? Yes. Yes. That's the first time I ever saw you when you couldn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> we already had an automatic fear of Tony and Susie. And I was so scared I could barely speak. Wow. I never remember a moment that I wasn't terrified. It's very easy to use the Bible to back up abusing children. We would actually be told, you know, I'm doing this because I love you and because we don't want you to go to hell. And Tony, would, he was sadistic. There was always a paddle. They called it the Board of Education. It had holes drilled two by two all the way down, and it had a long handle. For him, it was entertainment. For us, it was terror. The people that were recruited into this invested everything that they had in Tony and Sue. And I guess the cost benefit of either going to hell and burning in hell forever versus a temporary punishment, maybe of watching their child getting beaten, it was easy to make that exchange because hell was forever. My mom used to say, if I'm wrong, everything's fine. But if I'm right, you're going to go to hell. The word of God says, I love them who fear me. They were charlatans. And these people believed, so truly believed. Susan was the brains behind that operation. She's the one who started the cult. She's the one that could preach. She was the attraction. They followed Susan, not him. You're in total command here, of course. I mean, not, not in total command, you're it. Um, and nobody, it seems, can, you know, can say good morning without your authority. Are you training anyone to replace you? Every one of them. Every one of them. They told some of the most outlandish lies. She had faked cancer for years. Jesus Christ is a healer. I've had terminal cancer for almost six years now. I think, honestly, that when she really did get cancer, it was the biggest surprise in the world to her. My first personal thought was irony. That's ironic. They milked us and they lied about her having cancer for so long, and she developed it. A friend of my next door neighbor was a physician, and he was in the operating room when they operated on Susan. And they said that they just sewed her back up because she was just totally consumed by cancer inside her body. When she knew she was really dying, you know, Tony was freaked out. He was worried that people would not follow him. As long as my mother was alive, the brutality was still brutality, but wasn't like what it became when Tony took the place over. The biggest change when Susie got sick, I remember her not coming to church. And all through the beginning of service, we would watch the door. Are they coming? Are they coming? Are they coming? The congregation was pulled in to pray for her, and Susan believed in their prayer. I think she was a scam artist, but I do think she believed what she was preaching at that point in her life. I remember the night we got the message pray for Susie. And so I tried to stay up all night praying, but I'd already been up the night before praying. For about three o'clock in the morning, I fell asleep. I woke up and they told us Susie died. And I remember the guilt I felt. 
I was crying. Oh my God, when Susie needed me the most, I was sleeping. Even though my mother beat the crap out of me and treated me like garbage, she was my mother when she was dying. If I would have known, I would have gone. I would have. And uh, I didn't know. The driving force behind this multi-million dollar enterprise was Susan Alamo. But since cancer claimed her life on April 8th, the foundation member saying very little to the public about the impact that her death has had. Tony was heartbroken. He really loved this woman, and he was scared. They had millions of dollars by now. They had homes all over the place. They had control of lots of people. And I think he was afraid he was going to lose that. I was swimming in despair, and uh, I, uh, I couldn't stand it. I mean, I was just like drowning in sorrow. And I, I, I had to seek the Lord to find out what is that there's got to be something in the Bible that's going to take uh, the edge off of this. So I went to the scripture, and it says, raise the dead. When Susan Malamo died, Tony did not bury her. He put her casket in the Bridge Mansion, the spec house. He said that she was going to raise from the dead. Tony realized that Susan was the hold of all the cult members, and he wanted to subconsciously, psychologically transfer that hold to him. Their house, they turned that into a prayer chapel. So that's where Susie's body was. And they had prayer chains praying for God to raise Susie from the dead. I prayed very hard, very sincerely. And it was two hour shift she stayed and prayed. And it was around the clock, 24 seven. When I was nine years old, we prayed over Susie to raise from the dead. I was staring at her for so long, she looked like she was breathing. So I said, Mom, I just saw Susie breathe. And she goes, oh my gosh. And so this whole rumor went around that somebody was at the prayer room and saw her breathing. And Tony got all excited, and she's coming back. And it was not what happened. Since her death, Mrs. Alamo's body has been kept somewhere here at the Foundation Estate until a mausoleum or some other burial site can be prepared. I'm praying that God will heal her, raise her from the dead, so that it'll show the power of the Almighty God. I had a cow when I found out he had her in the house, OK? I think it's just the cruelest thing anybody could do. I knew that he couldn't run that other than into the ground without her. She was his marionette. You know. Susie talks to me from the Lord. Susie gives me messages. So it was, it was, you know, a con. He learned it from her. A lot of people, a lot of Christians say, how do we know it's God's will? We know it's his will because he made a commandment out of it. He says, raise the dead. The people who followed Susan in life believe in her still in death. One year later, she has not been buried, and members of the cult are still praying for her resurrection. When Susie didn't resurrect, I remember Tony screaming that it was our fault. We didn't pray hard enough. We didn't fast long enough. We didn't have enough faith. Somebody went to him, went to Tony Alamo, and said, She's starting to rot. Her flesh is rotting. And you got to bury her. There's a mausoleum that was built for her. I got the mausoleum. Susie's going to be buried. And I believe that he can raise her up out of the, uh, out of the ground or out of the mausoleum. Finally, he buried her. And then it was like a snake coming out of a hole. You're just seeing the very tip of it, and you know it's coming. Alamo's wife, Susan, died in April, and Foundation members are as silent about her death and its impact as they are about their closed society. 
There are those who question Tony's ability to manage the foundation alone when he used to depend so heavily upon his wife, Susan. My dad was in the room with Tony and Susie as she was, you know, on her deathbed shortly before she died. And he said that she grabbed Tony by the collar and brought him close to her and said, you're going to destroy this place. Let these people go. Don't continue this. It's wrong. I'm just going to keep serving him stronger and harder and uh, mightier than I've ever done in my life. The Alamo Foundation is in the business of saving souls, but the federal government contends that the organization has made millions of dollars without ever paying its workers minimum wages or overtime benefits. Tony is bitter about the government investigation and believes it helped put his wife in her grave. Susan wanted to avoid police and investigation and stuff like that. Tony was too stupid to do that. She knew what he was capable of, and she knew he wasn't that smart. Five solid years they've been harassing us, just like they're harassing us now, even though they know uh, that what they're saying is absolutely untrue. We would hear that Tony was in a court case fighting the one world government because we were exposing the evils of the world. We were fighting this fight against the beast. We were always told to pray because the government was about to take away everything. One of the most common tactics to keep the faithful faithful is an outside enemy, an outside threat. They all need a boogeyman. And Tony Alamo's boogeyman was the government. Some of his followers were questioned. And the followers said, we're working for the church. We don't expect income because the church takes care of our needs. The Labor Department is currently investigating the records of the Alamo's restaurant in Alma, as well as those from more than 30 other businesses in three different states. I believe this agency to be a Gestapo organization that is trying to destroy the freedom of religion. To him, it was some kind of a war. The law says, hey, if you want to turn the paycheck over and endorse it back to the church, you're free to do that. But you have to get a paycheck. It's litigate, 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 stall, delay, stall, delay. Because every year you can spend in court, you're reaping more benefits economically. Alamo has spitefully chosen not to computerize the foundation's records because he believes it would make it easier to keep tabs on him. Yet, Alamo says he has nothing to hide and isn't afraid of an investigation. The IRS found that they were living lavishly. They bought gold coins, silver bars, statues, antiques. They drove around in Cadillacs. They traveled. Those were just some of the things that the IRS found that were excessive. Even Tony Alamo isn't sure how much money the foundation is worth, but he says an estimate of $50 million would be pretty accurate. My mother made him a multimillionaire. She couldn't do much about making him a man, but she made him a very rich psycho. When Susie died, Tony was just a monster. He was yelling from the pulpit and chewing people out. It was as if he really hated everybody. And people took it. And when he saw people take it and not leave, it just kept getting worse. After Susie died, that's when the spankings really ramped up. Tony would be on the speakerphone and say how many swats the child got. Grown men, like lumberjack looking huge men, would lift us in the air, and then somebody else would get the Board of Education and literally hold it like a baseball bat. And he would tell them to chop wood. 
they swing with all their might because, you know, Tony said, if you didn't spank them hard enough, then we're going to have somebody spank you. Susie planted the idea in Tony's head because she was the original, you know, person who issued beatings. We would never think of reporting him because, you know, we didn't want to go to hell, first of all. Second of all, we believed we deserved to be beaten. It was God who was telling Tony to do it. We have liftoff. Liftoff of mission 41 d I remember when Tony preached after Susie died, and it was a monumentous thing. Tony said, God's telling me to leave you people. And I remember praying and crying and begging God not to take Tony from us. He kind of went away for a little while, like he was always out of town. spent lots of money in my store. I had these young, cute girls working for me, and he had no interest in them. He wanted to talk to me. He invited me out for dinner, and he showed me his diamonds. He was different than the guys in this town. He wouldn't even kiss me before we were married. I had never been married before. And then he just proposed to me. So I became his wife after we got married. We had to move to Arkansas. I suppose he hadn't been with anyone after Susie. So I was like the first one. I think he went for me because I looked like her. I think that he wanted me to take her place. His next wife looked eerily like Susan. Tony's a prophet. The Lord gave him a new wife. Now, I believe his plan was to introduce her as the resurrected Susan Alamo. And that was going to give him control again. Tony didn't stay single for very long. I remember his first wife after Susie. That was Birgitta. She was Swedish. Now, we worshipped Susie, and Susie was our pastor. And it was extremely confusing because Birgitta was no pastor. I don't even know if she was a Christian, to be honest with you. I don't even know if she believed in Jesus. He wanted me, you know, to go to church with him, be baptized which I didn't believe in, you know. I mean, it didn't work for me. Years later, my dad and Brigitte became friends, and so I happened to know, like, personal things about, about her relationship with Tony, which leads me to believe that they were just very into each other sexually. The only way I could handle him you know, was to have sex three times a day. Then he was fine. And if it was like two times, he would talk to the Lord and come back and beat me up. But if he did it three times a day, he was fine. When I was with him, I had nothing to worry about. He had more money than he could spend. It's hard to make it in fashion. It's very expensive. You need someone like that to um, pay for the bills. Tony certainly did not suffer in his businesses after Susan died. He could turn a dollar and he did all kinds of things that promoted Tony Alamo. His followers made jackets that became quite the fashion. 
There were blue jean jackets, bedazzled with sequins and rhinestone and airbrushed. They were called Tony Alamo designs. Tony had a huge ego. So here his name was being said, he was being talked about, they were wearing his clothing. You know, it just fed his ego and his bank account. I introduced him to salespeople in New York. He did well with the jackets they took off. Things kind of changed for the kids at that point because they started having us work. Essentially, it was a sweatshop. After the evening prayer meeting, we would all be bused to a location where we'd work on jackets until the middle of the night. Every single jacket that was made, we rhinestoned them by hand. We airbrushed them by hand. We had an assembly line. Well, their hands were little, and the rhinestones were little. So they could pick up the rhinestones and put them in the rim and then stack them on a tray so that the people doing them could hurry up and rhinestone the jackets. It helped production. We never were paid a penny for it. We never even got one of the jackets. We never got anything. I didn't know it at the time, but we were creating masterpieces and people were spending a lot of money. There would be hundreds of thousands of dollars. I remember them telling us within days, we hit a million dollars in sales. They sold them in mainstream stores. They were personally made for stars. When you see how Tony Alamo used the photographs of his jackets with the stars, it's nothing but a photo op. Brooke Shields, Sonny as in Sonny and Cher, all these people that we see and know that would validate him to us. So how could this man be doing anything illegal? I know the Labor Department heard about child labor, but that doesn't mean they had the evidence to prove it, because you have to understand that all of the membership was conditioned to lie. There was a doctrine called, it's OK to lie to the devil. And all of these federal agencies are the devil. The kids going to the sewing room, I don't think anybody gave it thought, you know? The Department of Labor needed to mind their own business, because we were doing what needed to be done willingly for the Lord. In 1985, the Alamo organization suffered a couple of blows. The Supreme Court held, if you make the sign of the cross before and after, you're still an ordinary commercial enterprise and you still follow the rules. Tony Alamo owed the IRS approximately 7.9 million after his tax exempt status was revoked. Well, at the time those decisions were made, Tony Lama kept selling the jackets, kept operating his business, kept making money. His businesses and everything, he had nothing in his name. So he told me from the beginning, if you divorce me, you're not going to get anything. I did love him, but um, he turned into the devil. He tried to strangle me many times. He said, if I ever left him, the Lord would kill me. He was preaching the Old Testament. You can have several wives. He was looking at young girls. He had eyes on them. to scare me. He had me followed for years. He was crazy, and his followers were brainwashed. Alamo told me himself, he said that he could do anything. He used to call himself a Teflon pastor, like Teflon Don, like John Gotti. And he said he could take a switchblade, slice somebody's throat, Dump them on the ground, have them bleed out, and everybody in the cult would say it was okay. It was the right thing to do because he was the prophet of God.
Tony Alamo was a master at evading the law. And the law continued to hammer at him in terms of tax evasion issues, wage and salary issues, but Tony was slippery. Tony Alamo had suffered some legal setbacks, but remains at the helm of one of the nation's most prosperous religious enterprises. We have missionaries in New York. We've got them in Dallas, Los Angeles. We've got them all over. Uh, Tony had a business sense, and they went on and expanded further. The cult wanted to go to Miami because at the time was there's a new show that came out called Miami Vice. We went down there to get in on the real estate boom that was going on. I went down there, I was chosen to go down there, and um, there was a little blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy riding a bicycle. I was five years old. They had rented a couple units in the building straight across from us. They were new people and something interesting. So I introduced myself. He comes up to me, and he says, who are you? And I said, I'm Carrie, who are you? He says, I'm Justin. Well, the whole time I was there, I was down there for a couple of weeks. He hung out with me. Every time I showed up there, he was there at my door. He'd come walking in, and I'd buy food, and I'd put it in the refrigerator for him and stuff. I called him Uncle Carrie at first. My mom was on drugs, and she had epilepsy, and she was a single mother. She wasn't really in a state to take care of me, so I think she was willing to let me visit the church. His mother was in trouble. And so we took him to Arkansas. You know, we lived with Carol and I on the ridge. And I ended up staying up there for a couple of weeks. And then I got word that my mom had died. And then from that point on, I just stayed at the church. I was adopted by Carol and Carrie Miller into what, you know, was a great life. It was so exciting. Oh my gosh, he was funny. He loved life. He would play. I mean, he was just, he brought a different perspective to us kids because, you know, he, he, he was just different because he wasn't born and raised there. So we all became friends. It was a beautiful thing. It was all kids to play with. I wasn't roaming the streets, you know. I wasn't scared anymore. They had adopted him out of an abusive situation, only to bring him into another one. I had absolutely no idea that there was any trouble. There was no warning or anything at that point. No warning at all. My brother Bob and I, we started a trucking company. We were making money like crazy. I mean, hand over fist. And Alma loved it. I would cast the checks, put $100 bills in an envelope, and go hand them to Alamo up in the ridge. And, uh, and then he... He would sit there and fondle the money like it was orgasmic to him. I was on the road a lot, and my son Justin was there with Carol. At this time, I didn't know anything about the beatings. I had never had any children. I had never been involved. The day that I found out about the beatings, when I walked into the mansion and I saw the beatings, I told Carol, I said, we have to leave. We have to get out. This place is wrong. And she just stood there crying and crying and crying. And I said, Carol, they're beating kids bloody. They're stealing money. They're not of God. And she just kept crying and saying, I don't want to burn in hell, Carrie. I don't want to burn in hell. And I couldn't break that. My brother was convinced he wanted to leave, too. You know, We could not convince our wives. And we were getting nowhere. So Bob and I snuck out the back doors of our house, down to the woods to get off the ridge property. About halfway through there, a bodyguard saw us and spotted us, came running after us. We took off running through the woods. We started hearing gunshots. They were shooting at us. And Bob and I ran. That was the end of it. There was no going back to the ridge for us. We were cut off. I have no doubt that they would have shot and killed both of us. If Tony said to do that, that's what they were gonna do. When I found out about the beatings, I said, you know what? This place is dangerous, it's totally wrong. I have to get out of here, I have to get my son out of here. I got away, 
but I did not get my son. In every one of these groups, one of the methods of controlling the faithful is to make them understand that if they leave, whoever's left behind will be punished. And certainly that was the case with this group. If you displease Tony, your loved ones, if there were any left behind, were going to suffer. My mom, Carol, told me that Carrie and um, my Uncle Bob were dead in Christ and then possessed by the devil, and, you know, they weren't part of us anymore. So I didn't know what to think. We were going back to California, and I told Bob, I says, I can't leave Justin there. So we went up there in the middle of the night. I went to the window. I went over to our bedroom. I said, Carol, it's me. I had been sleeping with my mom, and I remember waking up to this blood-curdling scream. She looked at me, and then she screamed at the top of her lungs, God! Boom, I was out the back door, and I was running through the woods, and they were chasing me again. All we wanted to do was get our kids back. Justin was 10 years old at that time, just a little guy. Well, in California, people started making these accusations that I still loved Carrie and I missed him. So I had the devil in me and they were, they were gonna have to like beat the devil out of me. At that point, I felt like a, a lamb led to the slaughter. Every single time Tony Alamo was going to issue a beating, somebody's life was going to change forever. Who willingly walks into the pit of hell? We did over and over again as kids. Tony was on speakerphone. We're all sitting down there on the floor. And he said, the reason you're all here is we want you to know that this will happen to you if you ever think of doing anything like this as well. Tony says, well, the Lord tells me that you deserve 20 swats. And they, they stretch me out over the, the arm of a couch. And then, uh, and, uh, then another man picks his paddle up. And you got to remember that this is what the Lord is commanding. So he's putting his back into it, thinking he's got to beat the devil out of me, or else he's not doing right by me. Halfway through the whole scene, they get another guy to come in because this guy's exhausted. There were um, two or three men there that would take turns. And then there were the women there, the parents or the moms or whoever it was that was there making sure that it happened. It was just an like, insane amount of pain for me. There was blood on, on me, uh, people in the crowd, and um, uh, on the paddle. I did say to my mom one time, I, I looked up at her, I said, I said, it's not fair, you know? And, uh, and she said, shut up, you deserve it. And uh, with coldness in her eyes. After that, I never, I never cried out. We literally saw blood coming out of his pants. His pants were sticking to his butt, and the blood was coming out of his. And he continued to get him all the way up to 150. And it was the most heart We were all in tears. When Carol was there watching the beating and wasn't stopping it, that was probably one of the things that, that, uh, that affected me the most, because that's who's supposed to protect you, so. Afterwards, I just remember laying there for days on my stomach and then proceeded to be moved around with uh, two pillows and a bunch of bandaging wherever I went. To sit on, pillows were to sit on. They believed that they were saving Justin's soul and it was the most horrendous horrendous thing because what ended up happening was he was never the same you know tony was an absolute coward 
That's why I like to beat up little girls and, and little boys. And that somehow in his mind made him a man. Another child is going to grow up an absolute mess. And they live now, I guarantee you, I promise you, no matter how they sound like they're just fine, okay? Don't kid yourself. They go home at night and they beg God to forgive them. Ryan, 
I didn't have this night. I guess it up just that one. And yeah, the old singer will be in all of his costumes. And that's the game zone and Zara Hills. Why did you do it here? I know. Still, as you know, my brain was locked with shower break and what's now was no piece of floor size. Stick as you need to do for it. Yes, I have to go. Yeah, it was stick as you can serve a lot of it. I'm all by enough to do the breakfast against the snack lot of it tonight. Her lot and her stuffy. Yeah, and the sister's pet. Since it's in her fuss on the dealers, you know what? Sleep with a fair. My wish not yelling on my skin. That's not scarabs. Not shy from the game with your ass. Not sleeping with the number on play. I bear with the thunder hot. My head up so on up. Oh, so we. Yeah, it's not usually in the help. I'm different guy of mine. ジナポットサミカソキコノキスキアリタマトサポソザナイカデボケリサノカワソタシタシュンジョサソノポスガニキコセマカワボコバソタバプパプカオメワソナ Mangan or whatever, and get through a friend. Do we 
city, if you shit when it's your money. Well, I'm just gonna raise a wee shit, get past, you know, it's gonna ease the eye of the snail business. We can have to see the bus, find a grown nest. Find a drop, we can have to see the deep myth, that's, you know, it's gonna be sick, I'm gonna walk, so we can get up, see it. Hello, gosh, this is my last new week, nah. I've obviously had to get a little bit of a little nah. And the shit, you should never know what they do. So I eat them a snack. Alright, and so it's filled up and I'm just looking at the little cash girl mode of yellow. And I'm in my room. I've lost the snow cinema. It's not going to work for gifts and I know we know. But my real earth is making it up and it's like, yeah, he's just straight. Sure, we'll get it back to shit. Feel on it. Yes, we'll be all seen with it. Get up, you're ready to get feeling weak. It's it. Oh, I'll be new. Uh, what the number of the lights that we are? It's not much. It's just a few more. Yeah, it is just no. I guess they're weary of them. It's empty shit. And I am a monkey camp. I'm just not moving to the shit. And the only mess will I'm gonna meet him or is I'm him. Every guy you interviewed him, he's saying a lot of niggas in his fifth, but I'm saying it's ass, you know. They're all saying she had an eye for the end, I'm just not my hurry, she's the one I'll let you know it's new. This ass girl, when I have Sarah, doesn't get the message, look. Bull fire, skill, sky, laugh, and I work it. Ski, snap, see, that's Sarah all bruised, snail, his blood, pop it. He'll show out and give it her with the knife, Sarah. The shit gets happened to be the air fellas in. Now, when you think say, say, slow my life, hey. Now, those masks be crazy. They came up with me a little bit, so I could the covers and shit, and that was how relief from the Catan, and the source yellow out, say, slow my life. You'll come on, because the fan of growing, if you're growing, growing, and that's not your ear, you're as a kid, yeah, with all the cell, it's lost, yeah, you little, yeah, you little, yeah, you little, yeah, you little, yeah, Yeah, but I just found you. I was near free. Sure, to this guy, this rose, and there was, guess, yeah, but there's no we fit. So I saw the old woman I must have been in my history. And the shell of remedy for the rose, and the elf, she said, and the shells, and the girl, poor heart, said, gave the beast, and she has a little about. It's near for the earth, and this is, and said, brother, you don't know, and the old mother's law is always at, oh, mine, and I'll retire for so long, my lady, and listen to her, and you take a step, and the other earth, and the mouth, but a bill. In your work, it's getting scratched in the fucking mouth, and it has scratched my people scratched in the finger room. That's through a lot, and it's not for through a lot, as if it must. It's never mind, it's not my amigo, it's not my way, no. It's not my amigo, but he ain't no way. There's no sign of him in it, and no sign of him, see? I'll fear for fear for speech, it's getting scratched in the mouth, because I'm in the room. If you're right, I'll get to the bottom of the room, I'll get to the circuit. Yeah, we're going to go to our room. See, but snake of the off, send me the off for a wee. It's more with those of eat in his old screws. I can never find the Lord know what to need the off. See, girl, then there's the wee no size there. He do we should not be a little space in the ass earth out with a one year though in the beat point. Sing his hair, her couch is done. Sing his hair, her hand, and it's her eat all us now. I'm <laughs> I'm gonna do it on a three-hum, uh, nay. Heard off, 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 nay